by Peter Curran. Peter, welcome. What an excellent welcome. thing. You That's know, so good. I, I have tears of gratitude that you've reached out to me in my uh, lonely sojourn. I, I've been sort of telling people on the phone, yeah, actually, it quite suits me, the lockdown, you know, the kind of <laughs> isolation. But boy, was I glad to see your ugly mugs pop up on the screen. <laughs> You've been reduced to kind of baking sourdough bread and making banana cakes and uh, and watching Breaking Bad and The Wire all over again. I mean, you know, has it got to that stage? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going, you know, every uh, famous or infamous uh, music star that dies, I'm going through their back catalogue relentlessly. So, I mean, I just got through the Stranglers, an intense Stranglers period before I had to dive into craft work Stop yesterday, you know. Right, um, right. So, and it's, it's really strange though, but you know the way with somebody, instead of memories, we have the time, or I have the time now to literally sit down and give stuff a really good listen, you know, both sides, uh, the way I did, um, you know, when, when I bought the record, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, which is, which is great. You've still got the record player, have you? You've never let that stuff go? Yeah, well... Uh, CD yeah. player. Well, oh, 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 oh. Oh, no, not even there. <laughs> no, I've got, I've got that. I've got a, a sort of heritage section. But right. um, for, for lying down on the chaise in the so, house, I would... So uh, heritage, has that, that been CD then, really? Yeah. 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 yeah, yes, exactly. Handcrafted. Yeah. So where, are you, you, where are you talking to us from? Is that, is that, that's a, not an attic, it's a shed, is it? Or where, where are you? Yeah, it's sort of, it's, it's, like, it's like an old scary attic that you'd lift off the top of a house and throw into a garden. It was in the house when we bought it. The house isn't very big, but the shed is enormous. Um, so, um, yeah, I inherited it. it. It was pretty fallen down, uh, even though it, it, uh, it's hard to believe. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but I've sort of kept it alive and now use it for bits of recording and stuff so it's 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 a nice kind of um if slightly um damp in the winter um place to to get on with stuff privately i put it no more strongly than that <laughs> have you have you been going through your musical souvenirs during this period and uh, yeah and many people we've talked to have been going through their old records and so forth and going do you know, I didn't know I still had that, or what the hell am I still doing with that? I should get rid of it, or that should be that could be worth a fortune or whatever. Have you had any of those kind of thoughts? Loads, absolutely loads. No shelf has been unrummaged. Um, <laughs> as I'm trying to find something to make my previous life uh, seem significant compared <laughs> to today. Um, but um, yeah, I've got, I find this um, uh, LP, The Exciting Racing Signs, of Grand Prix. Oh, come on, <laughs> no. Which... Uh, hold, be, hold that up a bit, a bit further, Peter, go. so we can see it. All right. Yeah. Oh, uh, challenge. So can you detect, uh, you know, without being without looking at the track list of titles, can you detect, you know, the sound of a, a, a 1950s McLaren or something? I mean, are you, is, is that the way it works? No, no, no. This, this is just, I bought, this was part of my childhood trauma, having to sit with my father and his four friends as they worked through a few bottles of whiskey, listening to the soundtrack on uh, Gerald McCusker's brand new quadraphonic <laughs> sound system. <laughs> so you can, you, you can be there at Monza, at Monte Carlo, uh, at the Belgian Grand Prix, and of course at Brands Hatch. So they, they used to sit for hours getting pissed, <laughs> listening to these cars roar around them. Was it just cars that they excited them, or were they... They were into hi-fi and quadraphonic, were they? Uh, there, there, there was a bit of, uh, well, certainly one of them, uh, Jared McCusker, was thrilled with his, um, uh, you know, his quadraphonic sound system, which cost, you know, half the price of his house, I, I, I think. And, um, but, you know, in order to lure people who weren't such hi-fi buffs in, he got the whiskey out and arranged the speakers and chairs accordingly. <laughs> Where was this, Peter? Remind us. Where the, 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 this was in Belfast. Um, in Belfast. Because I, I don't want to be sniffy, but there can't have been an awful lot of quadraphonic setups in Belfast. I mean, there weren't many. There weren't many in the UK generally, were there? No, no. It was. It was. Uh, there was a, a little sort of niche. Um, Strathairn Audio. I don't know if you remember there. Um, they used to do these. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the turntables. But there was a little sort of enclave of um, you know hi-fi fi technology. Um, oh, guys see. that were affiliated so they started to 
you know, make these things, which sold for literally thousands of pounds <laughs> in the in the early seventies. It was extraordinary. Do you know? I don't think I've ever properly heard a quadraphonic system. They even during the, you know, I was working in a record shop at the time where they were kind of launched. But I didn't know anybody who had them, you know. And then, then they'd gone. They just yeah. disappeared, you know. Yeah. By the late seventies, they they they'd fallen away totally. But you I, haven't I, you haven't still got any of the equipment or anything like that. Oh no no no! Um, uh, in fact, you know, tragically, the way these things go, um, the house is now just a ruin. Um, you know, and uh, the last time I was over in Belfast, I just drove past and just thought about the absurdity of, um, well, I suppose of a quadraphonic sound system in that you had to either sit yourself in the middle of it all or arrange herd people into the centre uh, and then and then insist Then that, not move and then just not, stay there in, yeah. the, in the perfect spot. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But I, I just, it's so vivid, that kind of room full of cigarette smoke and whiskey fumes and grand Formula One cars racing around my head. <laughs> what else you got there? Uh, well, this might, um, let me see, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm trying to build up gradually uh, uh, to, to, to the star items. Right, but right. But, but um, so uh, I interviewed Peter Cook once um, on GLR station, where we're um, all familiar with. And, um, you know, he, he was really lovely and, and said, um, you know, I listen to your show and stuff. So no greater thrill uh, from being a, a childhood fan. And I said, look, would you mind terribly just uh you know writing a little note you know signing this for me and uh he, he seemed to be taking ages at it and i thought gosh there's some kind of fulsome tribute um to me and uh, so he just passed it back to me i said cheerio and it was only after the show i looked at what he'd written so i just offered this up and see if if, if you can see what it says <laughs> <laughs> so uh that and that's that took a, that took him quarter of an hour, did it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pure no, poetry. He, no, he he played it to the hilt. You know, paused to look for le mot juste um, as I was looking at him, chewing his goose quill. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that's brilliant. Uh, you, must, you must allow Peter and I to just reminisce for a second about about GLR. Whenever I think back on my period on GLR, and I was never as involved as you were, the thing that amazed me is the caliber of people who used to come in to be interviewed. Yeah, yeah. Absolute legends all the time. Even the daytime shows, you know. Yeah. It's the only place where you can come on and plug your book in the middle of the day or whatever, and you get a pop record played in between, you know. And I sat in on the daytime show, which you must have done loads of times. And, and I had, like, uh, I had Michael Palin. I had Roy Jenkins. I had Anthony Burgess, you know what I mean? Yeah. All these people just queuing up. So legends like Peter Cook were forever in and out of the place, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. Th thank you for cheapening, cheapening my memorabilia. Um, but it, it was, uh, <laughs> but no, uh, uh, you're right. But I think, um, it, but at that time in the um, early to mid 90s, uh, like it or not, we were sort of the only game in town where oh. people, people would talk to, um, people who were not only, you know, interviewers or, or DJs, but who were fans of their work, who knew their work, who were, you know, so it was a, I think we were lucky in that we were a step off the treadmill of LBC and other, you know, sitting in um, a little booth and broadcasting house talking to uh, a million DJs around yes. the UK. So haven't had time to read your book, mate, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But good luck with the tour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come yeah. back and tell us all about it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> but this was a great period. This was Chris Evans, um, Chris Morris, Danny Baker, the, the time you were there, wasn't it? It was 1992, yeah, that, I guess. That, right? That's right. Yeah. When, when I started out yeah. there, then I did an afternoon show for um, gosh, about seven years. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the other items, when they were tearing... Uh, GLR um, apart metaphorically and physically when the when the station uh, transformed, um, I I dug um, six of these out of the bin, which uh, were the the producers oh. my, my producers program oh, right. diaries. Oh really? Uh, the the booking diary. So, so I can you remember. Oh, go on, read as a page. Okay. Amazing. Uh, well, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd tell you what was um, who who was in GLR this week in. Um, 1996 uh we had um 
live session from Richard Thompson, Michael Levis, cinematographer Jack Cardiff, Richard Dreyfus, um, Hugh Laurie, Billy Whitelaw, Brian Eno, um, Incredible. Ron Sexsmith playing live, and um, a live session from Gillian Welsh. That's not a bad lineup, is it? And and also, you you you're not cherry picking there, are 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 you? That's yes. A, that's yes. A, <laughs> it's a no, 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 honestly, it's, I'm not. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a regular week, isn't it? That, yeah. Those are the kind of people we had. It's yeah, extraordinary, I'm, really. Yeah, yeah. Because all those people were around, and as you say, there weren't that many places for them to go, or that they wanted to go, you know, where they have a chance to be spoken to by somebody who might be interested in what, what they were on about. That was yeah. brilliant you kept that. You haven't kept, you haven't kept the old, um, well, I've still got here, Peter. You've probably got one of these. Yes, I have. Yeah, the old uh, the old BBC right. uh, record uh, case. Well, there used to be one of those in every studio, and it used to say on the side of it, "Music for a solemn occasion," didn't it? <laughs> and this was music you were supposed to play in so the. If the Queen of, Mother died, you, well, you it, went straight. It, it was yeah. the Queen dying is what they were thinking about, and that's a long time ago, you know. And, and inside there would be kind of Elgar or whatever, wouldn't there? Be, there would be a list of instructions. Of, yeah. You know, song music you could play for a half an hour before you join the network or something in the event of that kind of thing happening. And of course, uh, it happened in a very different shape with Princess Diana, didn't it? You know, not long after that. Yeah. Uh, if it's not distasteful, I would say we immediately hit the Wham's greatest hits. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I, I, I really didn't mean. But I would say it, that there was a genuine struggle about what would be the appropriate music because the idea of a young royal dying yeah. just wasn't in there. It, it just was, wasn't. It, it was the Queen and Prince Philip uh, were yeah. the main contenders. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't thought of at all. What else you got there? Um, all right. Oh yes, when Bush House, which was where the World Service broadcast from, um, closed down, they sold off. Um, all their um, all their equipment, and so I, I joined the auction online, and because I presented quite a few programs from there, and uh, I picked up one of these you might be familiar with, which is oh, the, right, the oh, old yeah. Q light, the old Q light, yeah. yeah. So, um, speak, speak now. Yes, exactly. Now. Yes, <laughs> yeah. this is London, and um, yeah, so I wanted to uh, hang on to that. Um, and, yeah, um, you haven't got a pair of old Bakelite headphones, have you? No, like, no. I used to love those. <laughs> yeah. I know John Humphreys wore those up until the day he retired. But <laughs> he, did, he did, didn't he? Was it Tony Hancock in the in, in the Radio Ham where he got the headphones on? He says, oh, "I don't know how they keep those on all day at Broadcasting House." Alva Liden, Liddell. He says, "My ears are like two braised lamb chops under those." <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, listen, how, how are you two guys um, finding uh, doing this uh, without your normal uh, adoring audience? Uh, they're, <laughs> they're there to energize you? Uh, uh, well, we don't have a problem, with, we yeah, don't have problem mean, with energy, do we, really? No, no, no problem with energy at all, you know. And also, you get the uh, additional extra, you get to see into people's houses. Which we love. You get a little little view of their uh, their mm. attics and their collections of stuff. And uh, 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 you you must have been keeping tabs on the various rock stars who are performing in their kitchens and their patios wherever yeah. all over the world and doing what we're all doing, which is taking no attention at all to the musical performance, just thinking move a little bit out of the shot. So we can see, you see, the view, <laughs> see the view out of your window. Yeah. yeah. Have, you, have you seen the John Fogerty clip of John Fogerty doing Green River with his adoring children? No, I haven't. Uh, that John, sounds great. It, John he Fogarty. has almost the, the whole of California behind him, and it's just it's oh, it's nauseating actually. <laughs> oh. just, he's sitting there with his three fabulous kids. They're playing Green River by Green's Clearwater, and they've got an open fire. They're toasting marshmallows, and they're behind it. Just the mountains, aren't they? Dave? I mean, it's a, it's a mountain range. Wow. Just, he it's owns just most phenomenal. of Northern California. Yeah. So, absolutely extraordinary. And that's, and of course, this is what I'm doing with absolutely every case. I'm just looking at the real estate that people have got. Have you seen Robert Fripp and Toya Wilcox cavorting on their lawn? I, I have. It's, it's a bit a bit much, frankly. Um, <laughs> but you, what, you know, what, the leader of King Crimson in a tutu? 
Dancing um, to Swan Lake a bit yeah, much? Yeah, yeah. Isn't this I, what we predicted in 1969? I don't know. I, I think there's, there's a bit of coercive control going on there from Toya. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Controlling now, talk, wife. Talking, talking of Northern Ireland, as we briefly were, I just look at my feet, and what, what do I find but that? Oh, my goodness. Do you remember wow, that? Wow, yes, yes, that yes. Is, oh, that is yeah. the original issue. Wow, look at that. Of the Undertones Teenage Kicks. Wonderful. The, on the Good Vibrations label, and uh, which, as you can see, in the most extraordinary kind of... Well, there's not even any glue involved in this. No, no, hand-folded by the band, no doubt. It will be completely hand-folded. And the back picture is, of a, I'd imagine, is a toilet door... Yeah. On which somebody has scrawled the legend, the undertones are shit. Yeah. <laughs> has there ever None been more a, punk rock? Has there this ever is... been a record that flew in the face of marketing more than that record? <laughs> in it's every what, single respect, you know? It, it, it's brilliant. You know, there was a massive uh, jealousy in Belfast about the undertones um, because uh, they were seen as by us Belfast sophisticates as re regional upstarts and uh, <laughs> and you to be fair now you were in a band weren't you I, 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 which i can't remember it was either furious pig or just pig just, just pig just yeah. pig but the, the undertones just you know just almost shot out of nowhere they had the best tunes um they just they just had class they just roared through the slightly derivative sound of belfast but belfast didn't like it um, for, for, for a while, and uh, the people were very snooty and would tear down Undertone's gig posters and so forth. <laughs> it just bears out the great truth of the, um, the Mor was it the Morrissey song, We Hate It When Our Friends Become Successful. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's the greatest truth in popular music, it is. isn't it, really? Yeah. You know? And it yeah. applies even, and it must have been particularly difficult in Northern Ireland because you're all supposed to be on each other's side, you know what I mean? We're, we're, all, we're all kind of struggling to be, to be noticed from this outpost. And yet, even within the outpost, you're looking down on the other guys. Well, there's nothing, uh, I mean, the, the, even as much as talking loudly during somebody else's gig in a small venue was, was uh, common practice amongst bands. You know I mean? You could actually hear the roar of, you know, Barry McElhenney of shock treatment <laughs> at the bar when we were going through a quite sensitive bit in one of our numbers. <laughs> So and, deliberate, and, deliberate and, on oh, his yeah. part, I see. I, yeah. I, I, we never got to the bottom of it, <laughs> but we, but we re repaid the compliment um, by um, <laughs> shouting out lyrics to, to shock treatment songs um, at different parts of their songs. <laughs> it was it. What a fraternity! It's so touchy. I love oh, the, yeah. I love the, you know, the meanness of bands towards other bands. Who was it we had? We had somebody once on the word in your ear who told us that they used to go along and watch the sport group and they'd go and line up in front of the sport group when there was nobody watching them, really paying attention. And then at the agreed signal, they would all just leave. <laughs> <laughs> the sport group would be looking at Brutally like, just demoralizing. <laughs> oh. What did we do wrong? That's right. <laughs> dear, oh dear. I can well believe that. Do you still play anything, Peter? Or have you um, put that yeah. behind you? No, I still, still play the drums, and um, when I do um, music for uh, radio documentaries, I, I still dabble, uh, get the bongos out, no euphemism intended. Right. Um, so, but it's quite you sometimes different. bill yourself as a failed drummer, don't you? Which yes, very, so very much so. A failed drummer is your kind of occupation, you know. In some ways, <laughs> really? David Hepworth once described you as a wireless boulevardier, which I thought was terrific. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Well, yeah. I get, every time I get in touch with Peter, I still, I have to, I cannot stop myself repeating the old joke from a GLR trail that was done by Brian Sewell, uh, who used to appear on the, used to be on the channel. And Brian, as you may remember, had the fruitiest voice, <laughs> even, even in the world of art critics. Dundee yeah. Cape. And yes, and Peter got him to do a trail where he just read out his name, didn't he? He read out your that, name. That's right. Uh, and um, and variations of, uh, and he, uh, I just gave him a piece of paper saying, uh, you're listening to the Pretty Curtains show. <laughs> and um, Brian Sewell said, you're listening to the Pretty Curtains show. <laughs> and so I, whenever I get in touch with Peter, I always go, Mr. Curtains. <laughs> it still makes me laugh, the idea of pretty good, stupid jokes like that. Still they were, make me laugh. 
there was um, there it was um, a, a kind of little unspoken competition in GLR to get well-known voices to do trails for you. That's true. Um, and um, the the best one I got was um, I had to go to uh, the Claridge's uh, hotel and interview Al Pacino. And then at the end of the interview, I said, <laughs> Al, like, is there any, any chance of you doing a trail for my show on the uh, thing? And he, and he did it, bless him. Um, Good. Uh, yeah. What did he say? Um, um, Hi, this is Al Pacino. Uh, you're listening to the and then <laughs> Peter Carlin. Peter Carlin. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter, you've um, y- you've been doing these series uh, bunk beds, which people might have heard on, on Radio Four. Got a got a bit of a following. How it's, many? Have you in the four series or something? Um, it's it's uh, well, ser- believe it or not, series seven is going oh, out right, in August. Okay. Yeah, right. Um, it's kept kept the lights on, thankfully, all these years. <laughs> so, uh, explain for people who haven't heard it, how uh, you know what it's all about. Uh, well, it's basically two men uh, lying in the dark. The two men being myself and Patrick Marber, uh, in beds uh, with the lights off, uh, wondering why their lives didn't um, turn out the way uh, they thought we thought uh, they were going to. So, it's that the idea is that. That sort of delicious little delirium you get before you drift off to sleep when sort of random thoughts just kind of float out into the air. Uh, and because we can't see each other, um, uh, it's it's allowed to happen and we um and awe and think about what each other... There's not that pressure of visual contact, you know, when you when you have to follow up, as it were. So essentially, yeah. that, that, that that's it. And we play each other bits of music or archive and stuff. It's it's recorded. It's actually recorded in the dark, isn't it? Because you know, there's that brilliant thing, as you say, when you you appear to be drifting off to sleep, and the, and the, and the thoughts become more and more almost sort of psychedelic and and, uh, yeah. and extraordinary. But you're in the dark, and so when you have your guests in, there's a brilliant episode with Kathy Burke. There's a brilliant one with Jane Horrocks. I can remember. Are they in the dark? Are you all in the, yeah. in the dark room? Yeah, we are. We are. Um, and um, you know, some people are uh, you know sort of get it. Um, and, and other people, I mean, we, it was, no, I'm not going to say, better not slag anybody off. Um, anyway, it's an interesting kind of dynamic because those, some people do immediately get into, this is an excuse for a nice lie down and ultra low energy chat. And um, some other people are, are right. Oh, this is novel. It's a sleepover. Yay! Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, you know, but, but Patrick Marber is quite willing to say, look, will you please be quiet? We're trying to get to sleep. Uh, <laughs> Um, and um, th- there have been occasions that when it's just the two of us where we have one or other of us have nodded off. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's, it sounds a little bit like, and they pay you to do this shit. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it appears so. Very good. And so you, you, number seven's about to appear and, uh, and you hope there'll be others. Yeah. Well, if, if we can get, um, if we can get past the, uh, the lockdown we're sort of um you know august they start to go out so we need to be in the same room at the same time right, um, right, you know right. um, and there's a brilliant this, sorry i was just gonna say there's a brilliant uh, talking books uh, thing you did with the uh, revolution in the head where you re-recorded revolution in the head with david morrissey and danny baker and all sorts of people yeah 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 fantastic yeah. All, all sorts of people uh <laughs> david hepworth it's a very quite as you know it's quite a tactical book and uh, well, there were a few moments when even experienced readers like David Morrissey and Danny Baker were just kind of literally blood coming out of their eyes as they tried to uh, get get through some of the pirouettes and some clauses of Ian McDonald. Yeah, they talk about the time signatures on happiness is a warm gun. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. But look, I must show you these um, because on. these were um, uh, slightly chewed by my then infant son. But uh, in the mid-90s, uh, I went to see Clyde Stubblefield, James Brown's drummer, oh, um, yeah. uh, sound checking, And uh, I interviewed him afterwards. And I rather cheekily said, Clyde, is there any chance I could... And I was looking at the drumsticks. I told him I was a drummer. He said, yeah, go and have them. Uh, and um, so these are Clyde Stubblefield's drum-used wow. drumsticks. Um, which um, I, I, I tend to fondle rather than use an anger on a drum kit. Uh, but I thought, uh, you'd, uh, thought uh, you'd like uh, to see them. 
has he got put tape round one end is that um, th th these were these were um uh manufactured like this with a little oh, little, little grip thing they right, sort of came, right, came with that right. um uh yes yeah, so there you go that, that's, that, that's the have you, treasure <laughs> have you got any other drumsticks of anybody or are you, you you're just happy with like stubble fields you don't collect them as a as a matter of course i don't i don't have the time to hang around backstage David. like <laughs> uh, like yourself and mark you know what i mean you know, goodness knows what horrors imagine kind of collecting a uh, at the time, really hot band drumsticks, and you realise twenty years later their reputation is so trashed and tarnished that you wouldn't show them to uh, to anyone. I've got, I've, I'm got sure... I've got two over there somewhere. I've got I've got one that I begged from Dave Mattox, the great Dave Mattox. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Very and good. One, and one that I begged from Pete Thomas at oh. the end at the end of uh, when he was playing with Chili Willie and the Red Hot Peppers. This is their, uh, fi their final show at the Hundred Club, I think it was. This is pre, pre Elvis Costello and the Attractions. Pre Elvis Costello and the Attractions, yeah. Wow. So well, both, look, both those guys. the right ones. Them. I thought you were going to say it was the senseless things or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here's I my. Keep very quiet about that. <laughs> yeah. Here's my Osric Tentacles drum skin. <laughs> You tweeted something hilarious the other day about someone who had twins and they called their twins, uh, it's after my favourite band, and they called their two sons Liam and Noel, you know. And you yeah. just said, you just said, Osric Tentacles. <laughs> <laughs> that you'd have twins and your favourite band was Osric Tentacles. This um, is Osric and this is Tentacles. Tentacles, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, imagine t Tentacles looking enviously at his brother saying, I wish I was called Osric. <laughs> So what are you doing for the rest of the day, Peter? Um, rest of the day, I'm supposed to be, um, I'm making a series, a radio series um, called Lockdown Love Letters, which is basically getting people who have been out of touch with loved ones for weeks, uh, rather than do a, a text or a dedication or a Zoom thing, they actually write a letter and then it's going to be turned into radio programs read by uh, well-known voices who will wring every drop of emotion out, <laughs> yeah. of, uh, out, of, out of these letters. <laughs> Well, look, it's been lovely to talk to you. What a joy, guys. They're really nice. Absolute so thank joy. you. And, uh, you know, we, we'll, uh, we'll see you on the other side, as we say. Possibly for, for a pint of, uh, pint of bitter at the end of all this. Let, wouldn't that be nice? I'd, I'd certainly have to wean myself off red wine and tequila, which have, are coursing through my veins. Um, <laughs> not at the moment, but uh, of, of a Friday evening. All right. are, you in, are you inventing your own cocktails? Southern Comfort and kind of, uh, you know, the Glacé Cherry and Ribena? It's just, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I find that after, you know, literally two drinks, there's no point in continuing because nothing great's going to happen. <laughs> you just know your evening, well, it's, got, it's already flatlining. Um, so there's no point. So it's just, um, there's lots of, uh, there's lo lots of sort of, uh, Half open bottles lying around the place. Uh, right. Well, all the very best, Peter. Yeah, that's really good, good luck, guys. You. Yeah, you Fantastic. too. Thank you Thanks very, very much. much. Indeed. Cheers. Bye. Take care, bye -bye. fellas. Bye bye. bye. bye.